So after all these weeks of meeting, we're finally going to start scratching into the book of Revelation. <laughs> uh, yep, it's about time. I mean, we've already kind of been looking at it, um, like the verses I was just showing you guys. Um, but I feel like it's important before we even get into the prophecy of it, just understanding chapter one of the book of Revelation, which flies over so many people's heads because it's written right there. I, I don't even want to ask you guys because I, I don't want you guys to embarrass yourselves. <laughs> um, but but th there's a lot of people that don't understand what the purpose of that book is. I, I've heard it said, you'll know if a Christian knows about the book of Revelation if they call it Revelations. It's one revelation. But also the question is, what revelation is that? Um, but whatever, we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Um, so the revelation of Jesus Christ. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. This is Jesus speaking. And there was a point in time, mind you, he had not died yet. There was a point in time which he said that I don't know something. Only the father in heaven knows. There's something that God knows that I don't know. Capture that. So Revelation chapter one, verse one, <laughs> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Jesus, not to us. Pay attention to that. God gave him a revelation. OK. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So God gave to Jesus and Jesus is showing us things that will come to pass. And he sent it and signified it by his angel. But it is not Jesus who is speaking to us in the book of Revelation. It is the angel revealing what Jesus was revealed to by God. So a little bit of a handful there unto his servant, John and John, obviously writing it down for us. Um, but we know that he's speaking to the angel because you fast forward to the end of, of the book of Revelation and he, he bows down and he's like, no, 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 don't bow down to me. So he wasn't in front of the presence of Christ. He saw a vision of Christ in chapter one. But that was a, vi a vision that that the angel had given to John. Um, so at no point was he actually directly in contact with Jesus. Now, there's red letters in your Bibles signifying Jesus's words. Yeah, they are direct quotes. But it is the angel bringing them to John and the angel got it from Jesus and Jesus got it from God. So what is God revealing to Jesus? But what are, uh, be, before I get to that, uh, the word revelation in Greek is apocalypse. Now, unfortunately, we hear that word and we think end of the world. That's not what the word apocalypse is. Apocalypse is a disclosure of truth concerning things before unknown. So. In a sense, the, the way that we've tainted the word apocalypse, it's kind of better to use the word revelation now, which is obviously what we commonly use in, in, in Spanish. Um, it's typically rendered as apocalypsis, um, apocalypse, you know, pointing to, to that Greek word. Um, but it just makes you think, oh, don't open that book. That's the end of the world kind of thing. Um, but uh, going back, God, the father gave the revelation to Jesus, the son. Let's look at Philippians chapter two, verse six through seven. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. So there were things that Christ gave up when he came uh, to to to. To live out as a man. Now, there's a few questions that I don't understand that I don't fully know, because even before. Jesus came on earth, Jesus was still in the form of a man. Even before man was born. Jesus was still in the form of a man. We are created in his image, mind you. Uh, but was he eternally unaware of these things and not until revelation chapter one verse one well the the book of revelation did he come to know these things or did he always know then when he came to earth he forgot and then book of revelation came and now he remembers again i'm not entirely sure 
but just a point to ponder. I kind of like doing that every now and then. Purpose is to show the believers what will take place in the future. So that's one of the purposes. And, and it says it right there. Things which must shortly come to pass. So that's one of the purposes that we can take from it. But also, I, I definitely want to highlight that, that, that first intention. Jesus sent the message to, through his angel onto John. Now, we tend to forget that we are in a point of, of privilege of already looking at these things retrospectively. Is Jesus the son of God? Of course. Is Jesus God? Yeah, of course. These things were still unfolding in the New Testament church. These were doctrines that were still not fully established in the New Testament church. Mind you, we laugh at the Pharisees who studied the Old Testament and Jesus completely flew over their heads. They were expecting a king, which we are also expecting a king to come and reign, except now we understand that first we needed a savior, that there were prophecies of that as well. Um, so a lot of times we look at things retrospectively and laugh and ha, I would have never been that dumb, but we probably would have. Um, now, speaking of the first century church, that's what I want to focus on. They were awaiting a revelation. There's two groups that I want to point out to you. There's Paul, who is completely by himself, who is the odd one out. He is not part of the apostles. He was not part of the church in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, while Peter's job was to preach to the Israelites, Paul's job was to preach to the Gentiles, which is why we love Paul so much, which is why we have so many of his books. But a lot of that main, a lot of those main apostles and disciples um, stem from that local church in Jerusalem and the things that were happening there. So paying attention to those two groups, you'll see something that occurs. Um, so they were they were waiting a revelation of Jesus to come. Yes, he came. Yes, he died. Yes, he forgave us of our sins. Yes, we are saved by his grace. But there were still some things that they didn't fully understand. So it appears that Peter, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was waiting for a revelation of Jesus. This probably includes all other apostles except Paul. Mind you, remember, Peter was the leader of the church. If he has a question, you better believe all the other disciples also had a question. Paul, remember, he's outside of the group. Uh, mind you, just a little bit of background on Paul. When he gave his life to Christ because of that vision, when he was blind, all that stuff, there was even a period of time, if I'm not mistaken, three years where he was, you know, living uh, completely alone, um, like separately. He was not doing uh, ministry. But during that time, God was revealing to him things to him personally, which is why he was scared when he went to the church in Jerusalem. He's like, check out the gospel that I feel that I believe that God has revealed to me. Does it coincide with what you guys have? They check notes. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, yeah, it does. You're good. So it was like, OK, good. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing all of this in vain. But Paul is essentially that second witness. God revealed one thing to this group and revealed separately to a separate individual uh, the, the same exact thing. So uh, coinciding with the law of, 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 you know, two witnesses in order to uh, provide a faithful testimony. Now, um, looking at first Peter. Uh, let's see what he says. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, pointing at the idea that you're going through trials for what you believe in. But trust, there will be a revelation of Jesus Christ where all of this will make some more sense, where it will make a lot more sense. Also in first Peter chapter one, verse 13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely onto on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ out to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. That's chapter four. So there was something that the church, the first century church, was awaiting. Again, looking at this uh, retrospectively, we know what that is, uh, but they didn't know. The, the, 
the book of Revelation was one of the final ones to be written. Uh, and, and I'll mention a point on that in a moment. But Paul had already received a separate revelation, but his ministry was for the Gentiles. So again, him being the second witness. And let's look at what he says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. While this church had to wait for John to receive that revelation, Paul received it directly from Christ. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel. Again, him going to the church in, in Jerusalem to, to see if it, if it coincided. Uh, submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Now, what is that revelation? And I'm sorry, I didn't even list it here. That revelation is that Jesus is God. He is God. That's why. So John being the author of the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. There are theologians that believe that it was the book of Revelation that was received to John first. Then afterwards, he wrote his version of the, 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 the Gospel of John. Which is obviously different from Matthew, Mark and Luke, because he's now receiving it with a different eyesight with insight that Jesus is God. He wasn't just the Messiah, just, you know, somebody to save us from our sins and all these things and someone that will come with, um, in a kingdom. But the fact that the Messiah, that he is also God. And that's why chapter one starts with in the beginning and, and going all that far back. Now, looking at these titles of what it reveals about God, what it reveals about Jesus, you begin to see the trend. So let me let me go over here. So titles of Christ given in the book of Revelation, chapter one, Jesus Christ, Messiah. That's not his last name. Christ is Messiah. Faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, alpha and omega, first and the last son of man. He that liveth and was dead. He that holdeth the seven stars. He who walked in the midst of the golden candlesticks. He who had a sharp sword with two edges, the son of God. Um, he who searches the reins and hearts, he that had the seven spirits of God, he that had the seven stars, he that is holy and true, he that had the key of David, he that opened and no man shut it, he that shut it and no man opened, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, Lord, all of this occurring from chapter one through chapter four. To put it simply, to categorize these, these sound very Christian in how they're formed. These are Christian titles of Christ sounding a lot like the son of God, the beginning of creation, the alpha and omega. You would not give these titles to a man. These are not Jewish terms. So what's happening from the chapter one all the way to chapter four? We got the introduction. We got the letters to the church. And then um, we, we still have John now being in heaven which is what I've been saying is, is a short form of a rapture uh, per se when he was called up into heaven. But now beginning the tribulation, looking at chapter five and on, he is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's a very Jewish term. The root of David, another very Jewish one, the lamb that as it had been slain. Again, pointing at Passover, again, very Jewish. The lamb, these are all within what we would call the tribulation. Again, uh, uh, the, the structure that the Holy Spirit gives when he's when he's structuring, again, every single word, every single letter, every single duct per se is authored by the Holy Spirit and he leaves a signature. Even in the design, you see that there is a church, there is Jewish titles during the tribulation, and it's not until you get to the end of the tribulation Going to chapter 17 and 19 when he's finally coming down with his bride and all that stuff that he's beginning to be revealed now again as Lord of Lords, King of Kings, faithful and true, rider on the white horse, the word of God, the Lord God of the holy prophets, the beginning and the end, the bright and morning star. 
So just looking at that design is interesting. Uh, but a couple more things I want to point out. It seems evident that only after, as I was saying earlier, that only after John witnessed the revelation of Jesus Christ, that he authored the Gospel of John, which features a unique insight into who Christ is. And you see these same terms given in the Gospel of John, Son of God, the beginning of the creation of God, the word of God. Um, now, uh, again, you see these titles or are similar titles like Son of God being given in Paul's letters because he was given a separate revelation. You And, and that's why there's theologians that debate. Oh, but um, well, the critics more that debate. Um, no, this is this is a gospel of, of that. Jesus is God. That's Paul. Um, but no, it was it was John who also was that witness. You may not see it in some of the earlier letters before the revelation came, like with Peter saying we're awaiting a revelation. Um, but other than that, it, it's right there, plain and clear. Um, also, this uh, pointing to the yellow beginning, the tribulation verses. Uh, Jesus is mentioned through Old Testament Jewish titles, then omitted from later chapters until the end of the tribulation, where his full identity is revealed. Another interesting thing is that you don't see, quote unquote, Christian type titles. During the tribulation, it's finally only at the end. So again, there's some kind of design that, that I find pretty interesting. Now, let's begin to look at the 24 elders. So we're kind of skipping chapter 2, chapter 3. Chapter 1 was important, um, knowing what that is about. Um, we've already previously seen, you know, what the lampstands are, what those stars are, all that stuff. Um, so moving on to chapter four, looking at finally the 24 elders. Now we'll begin to get some insight as to what that is. So in Revelation chapter four, verse four, it says 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. OK, that's what the verse says. So what can we establish that they are not based on that verse? So. First off, they are not tribulation believers. And let me actually read that verse. They are not tribulation believers because if you go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 13, 14, one of the 24 elders is asking who those tribulation saints are. So the tribulation saints could not be one of the 24 elders. So let's look at what it says. Then one of the 24 elders asked, and, and, and the, the, in context, it starts from verse 9, looking at that vast crowd in heaven. Um, but just beginning from verse 13, then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are those clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones that died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and have made them white. So. They have died, though, that, that group, the tribulation believers, they died during the tribulation, the tribulation believers. They are not part of that 24 because one of the 24 is asking them, who are they? Okay. They are not angels. Look at uh, verse 11. They are not angels because all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders. It says it like that. So the elders are not the angels because all the angels are around the elders. So they also cannot be angels. Angels are also not given crowns and they're not given thrones to sit on. They are also not the nation of Israel because we see that they're still on earth in Revelation chapter 7 when you see the 144,000. And even in Revelation chapter 12 when you see that little breakdown of, of that woman, that woman being Israel. Now who are they? Uh, aside from the negatives, what are the positives? Who are they? They are the redeemed believers spoken of in first person. So Revelation chapter five, verse nine states. And they sang a new song again. A lot of times these songs give a hint of their identity. This is their song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seal and open it for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So they are not Jews because they are from every tribe and language and people and nation. Verse 10. Oh, well, verse I'll stay from verse nine. So they're from every people group. They can't be Jews. So it's more widespread than that. OK, let's continue of every nation and tongue. Verse nine. 
So now, why 24? Okay, so these are Christians from what we could establish. These are Christians, but why 24? Why 24 elders? Now, what is commonly taught, and I think it might be, I don't want to fully say it's not this, but what's commonly taught is that it is the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples. 12, 12 makes 24. Um, even though it's what our minds initially go to first, when you dig in deeper, it doesn't truly match up perfectly. Um, and, 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 you know, digging down a little bit deeper, you'll see the reason why I say that. Um, so why 24? Well, that would be, this is the first, uh, 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 line of thinking. Why 24? You know, you have 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples representing just all saints, you know, um, and all believers past and present. Now, aside from, you know, the fact that there's 12 disciples and 12 tribes and even this one parable, not parable, it was an actual event that occurred where there was a 12 year old daughter um, that, that needed healing and the woman with the blood issue for 12 years. That's another situation where you do see 12 and 12, um, one representing Israel, one representing Christians and how Christ first healed the woman with the blood issue, the Gentile, the unclean woman, and then later went to go heal the, the, the Jewish woman. Aside from that, there's not much else to go off of, aside from that 12 and 12. But there's a different route that you can technically take with this, which I think is worth looking at. Um, now, one of the main conflicts that I see with this is in Daniel chapter 2, where it states that Israel has not resurrected yet. Let me flip over there really quick. Daniel chapter 12 is speaking of the tribulation period, specifically the second half of the tribulation in, in Daniel chapter 12. And it gives a mention in verse 2 that Israel has not resurrected. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. And also fast forwarding to the last verse in verse 13. As for you, Daniel, speaking to Daniel, the angel, go your way until the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, the days of the tribulation that it was just speaking about throughout the whole chapter, you will rise again and receive the inheritance set for you. So there's a conflict if you're saying that the 24 elders are also represent Israel because Daniel has not resurrected yet. It's told to us that when the rapture occurs, we will resurrect. So there's definitely a conflict. Daniel, an Israelite, will rise again after the tribulation to enjoy in his inheritance of the Messianic kingdom. Um, and, and that's the verse that I had just read. Another thing I want to point out, which is when I was speaking of the rules of prophecy, who, who, paying attention to the who is very important. Don't take the words lightly. Don't take it, you know, as, oh, you know, you could just apply that to whoever you want. Same thing with the 144,000. If it says from the tribes of Judah and from this tribe, that tribe, what the Bible says is what the Bible says. God says what he means and means what he says. So it's important to pay attention to the who's. Looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it is the rapture for those who are in Christ. That is a calling specifically to Christians. So why are we assuming that um, we'll also meet up? This seems to be a gathering of Christians. That Israel still has their other promises that they need to, that they will have and, and raise to life and all that stuff, as you see in Daniel chapter 12. Yet this rapture appears to be um, first for the Christians. Again, us being the first fruit. Um, a lot of people usually don't go that deep and, and look at these verses that kind of contradict that. So, again, it still asks, it still begs the question, why 24? So if the 24 elders are only Christians, why 24? This is when we get to First Chronicles chapter 24, where because the chapter is 24, it's no, I'm playing. <laughs> 24 is the number of groups of services into which the Levitical priesthood was divided. So the speaking of the whole priesthood, it was it was divided into 24 shifts per se, where they would go ahead and 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 serve in the temple. So 24 different shifts. Another thing I want to point out to you is that 
Christians are kings and priests. Again, another unique title that is not given to Israel. If we are kings and priests, then um, if, if, if we're priests, how can Israel also be priests? Like, it, it doesn't make sense if you get what I'm pointing at. Christians will be kings and priests. And you see that all throughout uh, Revelation. To save some time, I, I won't open up to all of them. Let me go to um, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Speaking of the 24 el four elders, this is the same song that they were singing in verse 10. Um, and you have caused them to become a king of priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. Going back to the Gospels, I'm sorry, going back to the letters in the New Testament, you see that we are called to be priests. Again, these are things that are not given to Israel. These are not mentions given to Israel. One thing I want to point out is that the, 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 everything that Israel does is a type of what will occur in the future. The whole temple, the whole structure, this is actually a book that I have that, that is very interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew book. It's not a Christian, but there's a lot of details where um, the things of the design point to the eternity. The Levites have always been considered separate from the rest of Israelites, from the rest of the Israelites. In a sense, we are going to fulfill that prophecy. We, we will be the fulfillment of that type where we will be like the Levites. Uh, speaking of the millennial kingdom, I'm getting ahead of myself, but speaking of the millennial kingdom, when Christ is reigning on earth and we're serving with him, we will be serving in the temple. Us in our glorified bodies, in our transformed bodies, we will be serving with Christ. It will not be Israel serving. And, and that might be a bit of a punishment for the Jews for, for having done what they did during that tribulation and what they did to the temple. But there seems to be a specific calling of what I'm trying to point out, that Christians are not only kings, but also priests. Um, this all points to there being a fundamental difference in function between the church, the body of Christ, the living stones, the bride of Christ, and the sons of Abraham, the Jews. Now, I do not think that this is a difference that will occur eternally, but I believe that it is something that is limited only to uh, only until the end of the millennial kingdom. Again, during that millennial kingdom, we'll be serving and reigning um, with Christ here on earth. But once that's all said and done, speaking of eternity, uh, it, it says in the end of the book of Revelation, there will be no temple. Um, so during that time, there will be a fundamental difference. There's a difference between if you were, um, if you came to God as an Israelite or if you came to God as as a as a Christian. And I say this. Because there's different promises that God is keeping with each people group, again, going back to the who uh, speaking of, of the, the who's in, in prophecy. Let's go to the next topic um, with the four living beings, the four living creatures that we also see in Revelation chapter four. So there's a few different uh, odd images that are given to us, um, not only with the 24 elders, which, again, it could very well be uh, 12 Israel, 12 Christians. Um, but I tend to lean more on the 24 representing the full uh, the full scope of the priesthood of Christians. Um, but that's one thing. The next thing being the, the 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 four living beasts that we see in the book of Revelation, which is why I brought this book, uh, because I feel like God pointed out to me something that I have not seen any theologians actually point out. Um, so let's begin reading in Revelation chapter four, verses six through eight. It says in the center and around the throne. Remember, this is John. He was called up to heaven in the beginning of chapter four. He saw the throne, he saw all these angels, he saw the 24 elders, and now he begins to see these four living beasts. So let's begin to read that. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. Did I turn this on? No, I didn't. Um, 
covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is yet to come, who is still to come. In order to understand the mystery surrounding these beings, we must first dive into other references made into God's word. Speaking of expositional constancy, again, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be more fluid with these rules that I had given you from a long time ago. Um, expositional constancy is don't just look at one verse and try to interpret it here. Go. The Holy Spirit leaves a signature everywhere. So go to these other references and you'll begin to get more insight. So we're going to do a little bit of that expositional constancy, looking at those previous references. I'm not going to go to a biology book and look up what a lion is, what an ox is. No, I'm going to see what the Bible says about these things. And then gathering that insight, then I'll I'll make my final um, um, assumption, per se, of what these things are. So um, continuing. So. Revelation chapter 4, as we already read, day after day, night after night, they keep saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who always was, who, who is, and who is still to come. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, and a lot of people don't know the full book of, of Ezekiel, and that's fine. It's a pretty long book, uh, but almost everybody knows the first few chapters of the book of Ezekiel where he saw something very weird. It, I don't... It, it appears to be an angel and it just has this design with eyes all around it and 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 wheels and move forward and back and all the all these weird things. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the chapter and we're not going to read it um, for the sake of time. But one thing that you have to understand, and this applies to all of prophecy as, as we begin to dive into now, like the big boy prophecies uh, moving forward in the in the next few weeks. One of the things that you have to understand is that. You have to understand who the author was. When God reveals to you in your personal lives, because God still speaks today, um, it, may, it may not be something that you get <laughs> gets added in the Bible, but you know it may be a, a personal thing that you have to know. But He'll speak to you in your terms, where it makes sense to you. We see the same thing occur in throughout all the Bible. God speaks to individuals based on what they have as knowledge it's interesting that paul wrote so much of the new testament and laid laid out so much doctrine when he was a pharisee he knew the law he, he had all this knowledge and guess what god didn't laugh at that knowledge god used that knowledge and now we have so much information there thanks to his <laughs> pharisee background um speaking of daniel real quick daniel we all know daniel was given government focused prophecies you see the statue the beasts whatever it is um, um, um even even in in daniel chapter 10 when you see the war uh, going on in heaven and things like that between two nations a lot of times he was given government focused prophecy why what was daniel doing he was a key advisor to the king that was his life so god was going to speak to him through that um let's look at ezekiel who was Ezekiel? Ezekiel was a Levitical priest. So the things he sees, this book, it's going to read to him like butter. This is a boring book for me, but no, it's not that bad. Um, but he understands each and every little aspect of the temple, of the, the to, to explain to you a little bit about this book, I'll let you guys see it at the end. They have the measurements, and, and any priest, any Jewish or religious Jew would know this, the measurements, the design, the what represents this. The, the author who wrote that book, he's like, this is an abridged version. I could have gone much deeper um, where he would have been like, there is meaning in the measurements of, OK, this is four cubits and this is four cubits. And that represents something and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And they could have gone crazy in depth to things that <laughs> would just fly over our heads. So with that in mind, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, some key visions are going to fly over our minds because we're not privy, unfortunately, a lot of times to what a Levitical priest knew. 
I would encourage any any Christians who study that kind of stuff because, as Christ said, that stuff points to the future. So if you want want to learn more about the future, study more about that. So uh, continuing, Ezekiel was a a Levite priest. You must understand this if you want to be able to interpret his prophecies. So again, he saw something very similar to what we see in Revelation chapter four, where it had eyes all around it. It had these wheels. It had all these things. Um, And most people have made that connection between here. What I haven't seen anybody make the connection to is is this in Numbers chapter seven. Uh, Before I get there in in Ezekiel chapter 10, it is revealed what those things are. Those living beings are uh, cherubim, a a type of angel. Um, now, now, even though, yeah, that's technically the crack of the code, uh, I think it's interesting to look at something specific about that mention, which is why we get to, to Numbers chapter 7, which is why I brought that book, because it points to something that we may not have been privy to. In Numbers chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, it speaks of these wagons that had wheels. It looked like this. Look like that. Ezekiel knew what these were for. So Ezekiel, mind you, what did what did Christ say? The temple, these things speak of the heavenly things. This thing speaks of something that is heavenly. Um, again, we we don't know all the details, but I did feel God speaking to me on this one where I was like, hmm, interesting. I remember seeing wheels somewhere and wheels are spoken of here and wheels are spoken of here. And then I remembered about these wheels spoken of here. What are these wheels used for? These wheels are are used for transporting the tabernacle. The tabernacle being the, 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 the God's presence. So in the desert, every time that the cloud moved or, or the pillar of fire moved and they had to relocate, um, I feel like a teacher, <laughs> a little storybook here. Um, these wagons carried the beams, carried the objects of the temple. OK, let me continue. So first used to transport the offerings of the prince for the tabernacle. Um, ultimate, so it, it, that was the, the original purpose. It was um, an offering that a prince had given uh, over for the tabernacle, but they continued to be used, these wagons. So ultimately, they were used to transport the wooden beams of the tabernacle. Um, now, this, again, looking at the typology, um, it, it's, you got you to gotta look closely. Looking back at Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 20. Whenever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction and the wheels rose close behind them for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Isn't that what the wagons were doing? Whenever the spirit moved in the desert and they packed up everything and put it on the wagon, the wheels would also follow where the spirit of the living being went. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So in the desert, whenever the spirit of God went cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, then the moving of the tabernacle and therefore the wheels of the wagon also went. Hmm. Okay. interesting. Ezekiel confirms that these are cherubim, a special form of angel. And you see that in in Ezekiel chapter 10. And he's like, oh, these are the same that I saw basically in chapter one in my original vision. Uh, Another thing. So there's still more uh, symbolism occurring in these four living beings. in Numbers chapter two, we're not going to look at it, um, but what you see is is a detail of God tells them organize your camp around the the the, the tabernacle in the following matter: these three tribes go westward, these three tribes go eastward, these three tribes westward, southward, so on and so forth. You see that described in Numbers chapter two. You also see the amount of men in each of those tribes. Um, So, uh, of course, it's not counting the women and the children, but you can already assume the size just based on the men. So details a specific layout of the 12 tribes surrounding the tabernacle. This is what that layout looked like. Here you have the tabernacle and then east, I'm sorry, west, east, south, all that stuff. That's what it looked like. Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim, um, Dan, Asher, Naphtali. Judah, Ishakar, and, and all those other tribes. 
that's essentially what it looked like. So what was walking around in the desert? You have a pillar of fire by day, the glory of God in the center, the, 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 the heart of the gospel, in other words, shooting through. And you have a cross when you, when you lay out the numbers of how big those tribes were. And again, being Levitical priests, if God said south, it's south, not southwest, southeast. So you literally have a cross walking around in the desert, following God's every move, God's every step. So that's another thing I want to point out to you. The main tribe of the, of the four in which they had to uh, uh, rally against, they are also represented by a symbol. The 12 tribes all have a symbol. Lo and behold, those four symbols of each of those tribes would be a man, an ox, an eagle, and a lion. Hmm, the same as the four living beings from Revelation chapter 4 that had those four faces. You also see those four faces in the book of Ezekiel. So again, you see a repetition of these things occurring. The four Gospels, you see Matthew, who can be uh, a lot of times described as the Lion of Judah, speaking of uh, a lot of times Matthew focuses on the Hebrew prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And, and, and essentially it, it prepares a gospel very focused for the Jews. You can call that the Lion of Judah. Focuses on Jesus' messianic claims. Mark, the suffering servant, the ox. It focuses a lot on Jesus' works and servanthood. The things he did, it's very action-oriented in other words. Luke, the son of man, a lot of times it speaks on the focus of the humanity of Jesus. It uses a lot the Son of Man as a title. Uh, you'll see a lot of the confrontations and discussions that Jesus had in the book of Luke. And John, who is so different from all the other ones, can also be represented as the eagle. And it focus on the, focuses on the divinity of Jesus. Again, we see the same four faces, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. All these things are pointing at the same thing, ultimately, if we're, we're combining all these things from Ezekiel, from, from what we see in Revelation, from what we see in the book of Numbers, from what we see even in the Gospels, which those four faces are also throughout the tabernacle. Ultimately, the four living creatures point to the testimony of Christ, the glory of God, and the faithful witness which follows the Spirit, whichever way God, uh, which follows the Spirit of God, whichever way he goes. It's obviously speaking of something heavenly, but speaking of, of heavenly things, it appears that this follows God, the testimony of God. It follows wherever he goes. Um, so, so just to begin to see that from a slightly different light, um, we'll end here. And I definitely want to give you guys homework of the things that we did not cover. And what I challenge you, which are the most important chapters in the book of Revelation, what I challenge you is to read chapter two and read chapter three. Read the seven letters of the seven churches. Let me give you a, a brief synopsis of, of what that's about. So those seven letters to the seven churches represent seven actual churches that once upon a time existed. It can also be said that those seven churches relate to seven phases of the church of the church age throughout the ages that is started with the first letter. And most theologians agree that we're living that the, the, the church in general is living in that last letter um, where Jesus is outside of the church knocking. Hey, can I get in? Each unique church can identify as one of the seven churches. So this church multiply, it can identify as one of those seven churches. Also, each so so you, you this is a multi-purpose uh, couple of chapters that you can read. Excuse me. Also, each unique believer, and this is what I want to focus on for for your sake. Each unique believer can also identify as one of these seven letters. So this would be my my challenge and my homework to you. According to these seven letters, look at those red words. Look at what Jesus. Look at what God says. What are you doing good? According to those seven letters, what are you? doing good and what does Jesus tell you about that internalize those words he's telling you those words good job or whatever what are you doing bad 
Be honest with yourself. That's why I feel like this is better to do something privately. What are you doing bad? Now, what does Jesus tell you about that? What is he telling you? These are red letters. These are his words. What, what does he tell you about that? Is it the same thing that you've been telling yourself? Or does it differ? And I also want to point out, there's nothing bad said about Smyrna or Philadelphia. And there's also nothing good said about Laodicea. Do we fall into any of those camps where God can't say anything good about us? Or, or maybe in the positive, maybe he can't say anything bad about us. And uh, uh, one final tidbit I want to give you guys is um, there are churches where he says that if you're living a holy, a righteous life, I will save you from the tribulation. Hmm. So there's a choice that if I'm living righteously, there's an opportunity to be out of that. Again, uh, pointing at that pre-tribulation rapture, uh, which I lean heavenly on. Uh, so go ahead, look at that, try to do that throughout the week. And next week we'll begin looking at the tribulation um, and actually, you know, beginning to dive into that. Let's pray to close. Would somebody like to pray? Amen.